After 25 years in the fashion industry, I've realized that fashion is not really about the clothes, it's about the people. I'm Laura Van Root Poole, and this is What We Wore. Bunny Shapiro is a jewelry designer who is as vibrant as her creations. After an impressive 10-year career in the fashion industry, she packed a suitcase and moved to Mexico. And from that moment on, we learn how a new life unfolded for Bunny. Bunny Shapiro, so happy to have you on the podcast. And I'm actually so excited to have you in Charlotte soon. Thank you for having me. I'm so honored. I'm in Charlotte and you're in Mexico. Tell me where you are. I live in Puerto Vallarta, which is on the, oh, you do? On the West Coast. Oh, that's awesome. The love boat stopped there. Love boat. There's a lot of like Elizabeth, <laughs> a lot of Elizabeth Taylor stuff here too. Yes. Night of the Iguana was filmed there, I think. Yeah. Tell me where you're from. I don't know where you're from. You're not, I don't think you're from Mexico originally. I was not born in Mexico. I was born in Windsor, Ontario. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yes. I would, I might in the winter definitely may want to be in Puerto Vallarta instead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and tell me about um, being Canadian and tell me about Windsor. I mean, I remember growing up as, an, as a kid, I liked it, I think. I think I liked it. <laughs> I think I liked it, but I do remember the first time that my parents, my grandmother had a, had a condo in Florida and we got off the plane in the middle of December and there were palm trees and it was hot outside and I was so confused and <laughs> You're like, oh my God, does this happen? <laughs> this is optional? Like, <laughs> I love it. Winter is an option. <laughs> And I knew, I think I knew then that I always wanted to live somewhere tropical because Canadian winter, I don't know. Have you ever experienced Canadian winter? I mean, I went to boarding school in Massachusetts, which, which is really oh, so, close. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was absolutely miserable. So yes, <laughs> seasonal um, affective disorder is a real thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You have to like dig out your car and like start your car many minutes before you're going to leave to like defrost. Like sometimes you can't open the door <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. for your car. Yeah, that's hard. No, I, I do not. I don't think it's livable conditions. No. I don't think it's livable. How would your family describe you as a young person? I wonder if my mom would say this, but I think I always had a very unique sense of style. <laughs> I remember, <laughs> I remember going to pick out, like, I loved those floppy blossom hats. Yeah, obviously. That were very popular in the 90s. I grew up in the, I was like a, I was born in 1982. So that was, it was very like neon and kush ball earrings and new kids <laughs> on the block logo <laughs> tees and I definitely had no shame about wearing all of those things all together all and the time. What came first um your interest in fashion or your interest in retail? That is a really good question. I would say I think they kind of kicked off simultaneously. I used to watch this show called Fashion Television and it's a Canadian Yeah. Do you know it? Oh, yeah. I think I watched it, too. I mean, it was... Um, Janine. Yes, Janine. Yes, yes. I 100% watched that. Yes. Okay. So I guess... But it was still... It was it was out of Toronto. Huh. It was like our big... Yeah. Our big city in Ontario. I remember... Like, it would just be footage of all the runway shows. And I would watch this and be like, what is going on here? Like, this is... Like, people are wearing this stuff. People get to go see this stuff. Like, who is making this stuff? And <laughs> I, I was just, like, enamored. Like, I, I, I always was watching fashion television whenever they had shows. And I started learning about all the designers. And I guess this was when I was probably elementary high school. And, and also, I loved the mall. Oh, yeah. So, Windsor, Ontario is the border city with Detroit, Michigan. Oh, wow. Okay. And, you know, the, we call it, we would call it the state. Oh, we're going right. to the States. And we would go over the border and I would save all my money and then convert it into American dollars, which okay. was never enough to get anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Canadian dollar was weak in the 80s, I will say. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, it was, like you go to the bank with your little book and your cat and then you'd say, no, I want to have it in American dollars. And, and if you'd get like $65 for two, <laughs> 200 oh, Not God, like no. that. It felt like that. Yeah. But we would go to this mall called Somerset Mall yeah. in Michigan. 
and <laughs> like I can't even express to you like walking through like a Nordstrom's, which is not not the big it, like I would walk through a Nordstrom's like like it was an art gallery, like <laughs> like standing in front of the cases and like seeing the bags in real life and being just like and seeing the window displays like it was just it was a spirit like a spiritual experience for me and then we would see like gucci and oh. prada and <laughs> and like and then we'd go into like abercrombie because we were yeah you know, we only see these things yeah. on tv and magazines yeah you had a retail job in high school yeah so my first okay you're gonna laugh so hard but <laughs> The fanciest shop that we had in Windsor at the mall was Club Monaco. That was a really nice store. Don't knock it. it was, no, trust me. It was like <laughs> the most fashion forward, edgy. It, it was, was very like blaze, white blazers with black piping <laughs> ooh, and big buttons and longer ish shorts and just yeah, really puffy skirts that. <laughs> You know, and people thought you were so avant-garde if you wore Club Monaco. I love it. And so you got a job at Club Monaco. I got a job at Club Monaco. And I mean, can I fold a t-shirt stack? <laughs> Do you need a job? Because <laughs> I, I loved always hiring people from Benetton because they were the best folders yeah. of all. Yeah. No, so Club Monaco is better. More, I don't think there's anything more meditative than folding t-shirts and jeans, stacks of jeans. Oh, yeah. Did you work all through high school? So I worked there in high school, and I also worked there at their London, Ontario location when I went to university. Okay. And um, and, and that's when I started noticing that they had, like, a separate team that was very glamorous that would come in and change the windows, and they had this book. Merchandising. The merchandisers. <laughs> they had this book, and I wanted to see what was in the book. Like, wait, there's a whole science behind this. This is a whole career. This is a team. <laughs> what are they doing? Like, how do they know? And then I got hooked into visual merchandising. And so, did you study that in school and college? Yeah. So I went to I went to university for art history. Great. I studied art history, and then I went to New York City after that to study fashion merchandising. And where did you study in New York? At the Fashion Institute of Technology, FIT. We've, we've had so many FIT grads on the podcast in the last several episodes. Tell me about going to New York for the first time and what that was like and, um, and tell me about FIT. It was probably the most exciting 10 years <laughs> of my life. And I mean, I moved there with, I think I had two suitcases. I think that was it. And I didn't know anybody there. Yep. And I arrived and I, I, it was just like, I couldn't believe that I had been accepted and convinced my parents to right. like loan me the money to go because I had so many temper tantrums about it. <laughs> I was living in Chelsea in one of those New York City apartments where the, the elevator like opens up into the apartment <laughs> and you can see the Empire State Building. I was like, what is happening? This is <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> and then from there, went on to work with some greats of the time as well. Calypso, Theory. Uh, tell me about that time. I started my career at Bloomingdale's, actually. Which oh, wow. Is so iconic in New York. Mm -hmm. So I was working at 59th Street in Lexington, like the, the Bloomingdale's. Yeah, amazing. And before that, I did an internship at Chanel on Fifth Avenue, which was bananas Unbe like unbelievable <laughs> I've never I mean I, I don't have words to describe how my jaw was mostly on the floor like for all of that time I was so I was in the I'm in the windows in Chanel <laughs> on Fifth Avenue like use it steaming couture <laughs> what is this is a dream and so and so bunny it was always visual merchandising you were doing I was always doing visual merchandising. Thank goodness you had a degree in art history, don't you think? I mean, didn't that inform, I think, your, sounds like your, your career? We would sit in hour-long lectures and just look at the canon of art history with these incredible professors, and they were they were describing and we were critiquing. And, I mean, I just, I think I sharpened my eye so much in 
in that time. Like I wasn't even visual merchandising yet, but we were, we were always talking about color and form and shape and what's good and what's weird. And yeah, always, always writing papers about these things. After FIT, you were in New York for how long? For 10 years? I was there for 10 years. Yeah. What was your most fulfilling role in that, in that time period? Ooh, that's a great question. You know, I, I was hired by actually the, my, my supervisor at Chanel then went to Calyp was hired by Calypso and he brought me from Bloomingdale's to Calypso. And that was a really special time oh for, my God. for that brand, which I'm, I'm sure you know the history of. Oh yeah. We carried it. <laughs> uh, what's that? You carried, we carried it. it. Yeah, for sure. Right in, in the heyday. And, and just to be able to work with color, I would imagine at a place like that was just extraordinary. Well, I was thinking about it as well, because at the time, the president was Stephanie Dirienzo Smith, and she came from J. Crew, and she mm. was she was one of the most talented women that I've ever worked with, worked for. She taught me everything about fashion business, about marketing, about color, about, I mean, she literally knew everything about everything at the highest level, like the most sophisticated level. Yeah. Stephanie, if you're listening, she's probably blushing. But <laughs> she taught me everything, everything, everything. And I I owe a lot of my education my education and success now to to her and, and her teaching. And we she gave me so much responsibility. I became the director of visual merchandising there and we opened stores all over the world. Wow. We yeah, you did. Stores. In fact, Bunny, our store in Brentwood is in the old Calypso store. <laughs> uh, it totally is. And we would, I got to travel and see the most unbelievable places in retail. I mean, Brentwood Country Mart. We opened Marin Country Mart. We opened a shop in Hawaii. We opened a shop in Montecito. Like, oh, wow. The most gorgeous plazas of retail <laughs> in the world. Yeah, and for somebody who loves retail as well as merchandising, like that had to be heavenly. And so what was that the pinnacle of this part of your career? I mean, is that is that the height of where you would have wanted to be or what, what was the goal? I liked the traveling and I liked being the direct I liked being the boss. <laughs> I liked being the director. <laughs> and then I got hired as the global director for menswear at Theory. Mm in the meatpacking district in New York. And I think that was probably the, on paper probably was my most impressive role. Yeah. <laughs> and again, like just working with very, very top, top tier people, Andrew Rosen and yeah. tons of exec, tons of fashion people were coming in and out of there. And, and being able to have and, lunch at Pastis every day. Having lunch <laughs> at Pastis every day and that, all of those places. Yeah. And we ended up traveling to, I got to go to Paris with them for the first time. And, and again, I was working under a very talented director. Um, his name is James Mills and he's like another genius, another retail genius. He came from Club Monaco, Ralph Lauren world. Do you know James? No, no, but I love the oh. Club Monaco collection connection. I'm, I think that's great. In these roles, I mean, the clothes are so different and the stores are so different. Did you, every time you jumped into them, did you always feel confident about your eye and sort of what you could do to, to make it visually beautiful and appealing and sell? I mean, the retail part is obviously the most important part. Like, you know, mer merchandising is about making people buy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, at Theory, they had a very specific... Well, they had lots of specific visions um, and lots of different cooks in the kitchen. And so there wasn't a ton of room for my own personal creativity at Calypso. They had definitely a style, but they were there was a lot more room to improvise and have new ideas and things. And Theory was a more established brand and kind of a set way of doing things. And so creatively, I was I needed to do something else. And so... And so as a result, I left that that company and that led to me starting my own brand. I was going to ask about that period. You had a lot of success. Did, do you have a favorite failure during that time? I would 
say that we didn't jive creatively at theory. Like it just, it was a very different aesthetic than, than I was used to. And so as a result, I was, I was laid off. They, they were downsizing all of their departments. And at that time, I mean, I, I don't know if it's really a failure because I was, it's an opportunity, really. I was planning to, I had taken this trip during that time with a friend and we were in Tulum in Mexico. And I was like, once again, just like, like winter is optional. I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. We were, and this is old Tulum, like seven, eight years ago. And we were walking through the, the little town and there were all these girls just, they were not wearing shoes. They were smoking cigarettes. The store was had no ceiling. They were sitting in hammocks, just chat, chat, chat. Kind of, they would just gesture to the rack of clothes, like, <laughs> "This is what we have. You want me to ring you up? <laughs> Don't bother me. I'm having a nap, basically." And I was like, "Wait a minute. <laughs> this, this is an option." <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I got on the plane after that trip and I said to my friend, I'm moving to Mexico. And she went, Oh no. <laughs> and, and then at the same time, at the same time they were doing the layoffs and they said, you're going to be laid off. And I, I said, well, that's actually perfect. <laughs> Good. I was planning to move to Mexico. <laughs> and so what did you do when you got there? And did you, did you go with two suitcases again or did you like actually just move? I sold all of my stuff in New York and I dropped a few special things off at my parents' house, and I brought my dog and a suit. Yeah, and I think there was a suitcase and a half this time. <laughs> I didn't have. I was moving to Mexico. I didn't need like right. leather pants. No, you didn't need a jacket. Did your parents think you were nuts, or were they supportive, or how did that go? They were really my. I think my mom was okay. My dad was really mad. He, he said <laughs> this was not the plan. Like. <laughs> How could you be leaving your, 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 the height of your career in New York city? And I, that's what he said. He said, this is, this was not the plan. <laughs> <laughs> and so you got down there and, and what did you do when you got there? You didn't work for the girls with the SIGs. You, you, you did something else first. I did. I, uh, I came here and I took a course on how to teach English oh, as wow. ESL. And I thought, I really did think that I was going to just hang by the beach and teach a few hours of English. Did you speak Spanish? No, not one word. (laughs) word. I don't know what, how, but I didn't speak any Spanish. I didn't even consider that. But you got down there and you got the job, the ESL job. Yeah, I was teaching at a Mexican high school, and I didn't oh my know god, any, that must have been I didn't amazing. know any Spanish, and they didn't know any English. Oh my god, that's so awesome! <laughs> yeah, how long did you do that? I did that for eight months, but during that time, I it was very fast. I I had stumbled into a bead store here, right? And I don't know if you know this, but I actually had an appointment with an intuitive. Because, like, basically a psychic. I do not know this. I'm so excited okay. to hear this. Okay. Okay. So I said, so she's a, she's like a world famous intuitive. Her name is Sarah Wiseman. And I thought, I should just check in with someone and see if I'm on the right path and just make sure. Yeah. And so we had this session and I said, I'm teaching English and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And am I on the right? <laughs> am I doing the right thing? And this was, in, uh, this was a few weeks of me being in Mexico. And she said, actually, no. She said, no. And she said, you're actually starting a business. You're starting a company. It's, it's going to be your name. It's online. It's really big. She said, not Lady Gaga big, but <laughs> it's big. And she said, and it's not, nobody has ever done anything quite like it before. I paid all that money for this crazy person to tell me that I'm starting a business. Like (laughs) that is, I, and I cried. I was so confused and mad at, cause I thought that this other thing (laughs) and literally days later I had, I stumbled into this bead store and made some, some bracelets for my friends. And had you, I mean, did you ever have a, a beaded anything before? I mean, was this completely out of the blue? Or was you, were I, you always like, oh, ben, Bunny's the girl that loves the 
beaded bracelets. I did always love bracelets and woven bra. I always had stacks of bracelets growing up and I had a loom when I was a kid. I did always love beads. Oh, that, okay. I did. And so what was the first thing you designed? And I mean, was it just off the bat, you just started making them and selling them? And how did you do that? I mean, I don't know. It all just happened. This like all happened to me. I don't have any recollection of setting out to do anything specific. I just took all these beads and these pieces of like basically silk yep. and threaded them on and tied some knots and gave them to my friends. And they were like, oh, these are so cute. What, what is this? And I was like, I don't know. They're just bracelets. <laughs> made for you and then somebody else wanted one and somebody else wanted one and then somebody else wanted to buy them for Christmas gifts for their friends and I was like oh I guess I make bracelets now it sounds like you settled in really easily and it felt yeah, natural they were my teacher my English teacher friends. oh I love it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how really how did you set up the business how did you start to sell them other than giving them to friends friends. Yeah. So they evolved pretty quickly. And I started making these beaded, these beaded chokers that had a little piece of gold in the center. It was like, this was the signature piece. And I was starting to use Instagram at this time. This was like seven years ago. And I got an email. I'm not even kidding. I got an email in my inbox from the accessories coordinator at Cosmopolitan magazine and she was like oh we need some samples for a beauty editorial that we're doing and you're like samples of what <laughs> what <laughs> like, they're like we love these chokers we love these chokers like can you send us a bunch of these in all different colors and if you have any bracelets and I was like what <laughs> I'm literally making these in my bedroom what are you talking about and it was one of the next like most exciting thing that had ever happened to me in the industry, having a magazine out ask you for samples. And how funny for, I mean, just the 360 of coming back to New York and having that whole world come back to you is interesting too. Isn't that so funny? Are you in the zone when you're doing that? Like you're making them yourself. I'm totally in the zone when I'm making them. Sometimes I feel like I'm possessed, like I just... <laughs> overtaken by the bead the bead gods I can go somewhere else for many for hours and then there's this whole collection that wow it, I'm like, whoa like what is this stuff like <laughs> like I said I don't sit and draw I don't put the colors I just it's all inspiration it's just yeah did you have any tutorials or did, or did you just figure it all out on your own yeah, I totally did not know anything about how to make anything. And I would go to the bead store and I would like, every time I would go, I would ask them like, well, what, you know, piece do you use for this thing? And well, what tool would you use for that? And what do, 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 do. And so these, these ladies would just, I mean, the mechanics of, of, of the clasping and that stuff isn't rocket science. So right. I was able to learn that part. And then what happens in between the class is it's like paint. It's like painting. Yeah. It's like me. painting. Yeah, it's for like sure. <laughs> yeah. And you love the way the beads feel and the, whatever they're made of and all of that must really speak to you. I get super inspired by the material. So I do a lot of, I can go for hours looking at Etsy bead shops and <laughs> bead places from all over the world. Like you've never seen me in a bead shop. It's, <laughs> Not for believing. <laughs> I tell people like you don't want to go with me to do this. It's... And at this point, are they still all completely made by you? No, I have a team yeah. of four girls that work with me now. Yeah, and and what's it like um, teaching them? Was that hard since you're? It was so intuitive for you. Actually, some of the styles that we do now are stitched, and just by like the serendipity that is my life, I found this amazing woman who knows this technique huh. already and is a, an amazing right. stitcher. Amazing, amazing. So basically I produce the sample and then she, and she copies it. We just did a hundred bracelets for a, like a, an event in Los Angeles. Not we, like her. And I think she 
she has a little team right. as well. That That's super her. cool too, though. So the people do your your team works in their own home. My yeah, all my girls work in their own homes, and they're super talented. I mean, I'm so lucky to these women are so dedicated and so honest and yeah. really talented and fast and. How cool. And it's great to be able to, I mean, the best part is being able to offer them a wage that is way, way above yeah. the the common wage here. And, and to work with all women is pretty extraordinary, too. Totally. You opened a retail store. I did. I opened a retail <laughs> store. In, in Puerto Vallarta? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, how crazy is that? How exciting. And and did you always know that you wanted to do that? And did you know you would have enough inventory to be able to do that? I didn't know anything. That's just the, <laughs> this is apparently like the theme That's the of tr- how I roll. That's the trend. Like, yeah. <laughs> no clue. Uh, I've been led to this. I would, this, my shop, which I'm in right now is I lived around the corner for a couple of years and I was making all of my my stuff and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be so cool to have a place where I could see everything laid out because mm-hmm. I grew up as a retailer, basically. Yeah. And I can see the collection. I can merchandise it and know what we need, what needs, you know, what colors we need. And then I walked past this storefront and it was for rent and it was like, boo, boo, boo. It was more money than I could afford at the time. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have any, I didn't have anything to sell. I, I didn't. <laughs> Like, well, here's five bracelets, and then those ones sold, and then there were ten, and then there were twenty, and then there were a hundred. And wow, does the store have a a place for people to make their own, or is it all it's all made and to buy? I mean, is it a, a an interactive experience at all? It has. I have a very strange business model, but yeah, it has evolved into this very custom. Cool custom experience and I'm I'm always here so there's no sales associate so people come and they want they want this one but no red and they want this <laughs> one but out of this and can you make it shorter can you make it longer can you make it a necklace can so I do invite like special clients come or if they want to sit and go through all the beads I have trays and they can gather what they want to put I it's fun it. yeah really fun and has that been fun to to interact with clients directly? Because I think because obviously it started completely online and and through social media, it's a completely different thing to work with humans. <laughs> it, yeah, it is, and I'm like it. I just can't believe after. I guess it's been almost seven years. I guess it would have been. Fi- it's almost five years in the store, and just how many loyal, special client. I mean, I'm sure you know this, but like clients that become your friends and that become lifetime, lifetime clients. And I'm shocked at how much I know about each, but like, I remember what piece they got last year. I remember what colors they like. You don't like, this one doesn't like red. This one does (laughs) only likes black, white, and gold. This one only (laughs) wears silver. Like I just, and then when I'm making things, I kind of, I'm like, okay, so-and-so has these already. So-and-so has those already. This would be great for this person. I'm going to add this for so-and-so. I love that. It's become such a personal, such a personal one-on-one custom artisanal thing. Which is so nice because you see beginning to end, like the, the delight of the client, which is, um, I think really rare in retail, you know, you, 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 the more successful, like I feel like, like the further away you get from the clients. And so Mm -hmm. um, how joyful really to be able to have that experience with the clients all along the way. Yeah. It's really nice to Interact. I mean, I'm the maker and the shop girl and the merchandiser. And <laughs> could you open other stores, or do you have to be there? Do you want to do it with me? <laughs> I I don't think I can open any more. I, three uh, is my limit. <laughs> you have so many. You know what? It's a. I never thought anybody would ever ask me that, but people ask me that, and I don't know the answer. I I don't. I mean, I moved here so that I could live a life that was a flexible schedule and go to the beach whenever I wanted to. And if I want to close, I close. And so I think that's the like American dream is to open all these stores. Yeah. But, but the Canadian that, dream. 
<laughs> the Canadian dream. <laughs> I don't know. And because then, you know, what it, it's a lot of other things. You need, you need more people. Yeah. I mean, I think that's also, that, I mean, I definitely can t- say that is that you forget that opening more stores means a larger team and, and there's so much goes into training and I mean, all the stuff. And also just that you, like you said, you open a store because you have a vision of how you want the the retail experience to be for a person. And it's really hard when, it's just hard when you're not doing that, when you're not mm-hmm. a part of that. I mean, it's hard to let that go. I can say all across the country, but. Yeah, it's, it's, it's super exciting to think about, but I also love just, I love kind of nurturing the relationships that I have with other amazing stores that are already amazing, like you guys and, you know, all, all the other yeah. super special accounts where you already know how to do all that stuff and that's, the right. jewelry is there. And yeah. What is your vision for Bunny Shapiro in the next 10 years? You or your brand? We're starting a fine jewelry collection. Oh my God. I'm so excited about that. Really? Yeah. I always wanted to be kind of in the case next to all my faves. Yes. And I just admire, I mean, I admire so much the work of of the fine jewelry industry. I mean, there's so much incredible stuff. So I, I thought it would be really cool to mix, you know, like the high, low yeah. thing. So I've taken some, well, I mean it's already, some of the pieces are already ready. So, uh, lost wax casting, so sculpting, sculpting small charms and then doing them in gold and, and sterling silver has been really fun. And there's, I have a clientele for, for that. You sure you definitely do. And tell me about the craftsmanship. I mean, has that been hard to navigate in Mexico or has it been, are you almost lucky that you're there? Cause it's probably really good. (laughs) so good yeah. it's so good and the people are i mean it's like the fluidness of this whole journey has been is, is just shocking like the the casting house is down the street amazing and then you know the man that showed me how to do the lost wax casting was a friend of a friend who happened to pop in and i said can you show me how to do this and he sat here at my desk and showed me what tools and how to carve and then take it to the casting house and he makes the mold and then it's filled with gold. Bada boom, bada bing. Like, <laughs> it's crazy how easy. Oh, do you want diamonds? We have diamonds. Oh, do you want? Oh my God. I love mm-hmm. how exciting and how exciting to learn something completely new and, and be excited, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I think mm-hmm. is sort of rare um, in a career, but is that's really for me, the goal is to keep on getting excited about things and continue to be, I don't know, curious, I guess. I love how brave you are and how you, you listen to your intuition and, and jump into things. <laughs> I don't think people do. I don't think that's a completely typical thing. How does spirituality play into, into your life? It's a huge part. It's probably the, I didn't know it. I didn't know anything about spirituality until I was probably 30, 29, 30. I was kind of introduced to meditation and looking inward and listening for guidance and got interested in all kinds of books and spiritual teachers and things. And so, I mean, it's the guiding force for, for everything. And it's crazy because, well, what I believe is that, and what I've heard (laughs) is that everybody has their own map. Mm. It's, it's a treasure hunt. Like you already have the map inside. Right. But if I got quiet enough, I got quiet enough to hear the, the direction and whatever that feels like for, for, I mean, for me, it feels like feelings in my, in my stomach, like "Hmm, that feels really cool and fun and expansive where that feels like a bad idea. Sometimes (laughs) I do the bad idea things anyways, but um, (laughs) even if my stomach's like, no, that's not a good idea. Sometimes I do that, but I just really trust my intuition and I trust the the guidance, like the intuitive thoughts that I get. Will you talk to me a little bit about converting to Judaism and how that happened? And did it happen yeah. and did it happen in Mexico? No, it happened in New York City, probably I guess now eight years ago. I grew up in in Windsor, Ontario, and I went to school with 
at what seemed like all Jewish kids. Hmm. And I, <laughs> I gravitated <laughs> to them so much. I loved their names. Like they all had these fabulous, really crazy names. I, I just had all of these friends and they were, I don't know, they were really cool and their parents were really cool. And I just loved all of the holidays they had. And they had, they had bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and they had, um, I mean, they were always going to this weird synagogue place and then these like cute little hats to wear. I mean, and they had great, all- great dinners together. <laughs> great dinners together. And I, <laughs> super loud. And I, I just loved, I loved the names of these people. And I, I don't know, there was something so glamorous about the, the Jews that I grew up with. <laughs> and, and they all love to shop. They love to shop. They love to shop. And I really felt I was very confused why I wasn't Jewish, because I felt like I really belonged in that community. Yeah. And all my friends were Jewish. And we all got we got along really well, and so the Jewish summer day camp was just down the street from my my childhood home. Yeah, and I said to my parents, "Well, all my friends are going to Jewish summer day camp. Can I can I go?" And they said, "Well, sure, why not?" And so that just you know, <laughs> my parents think they had nothing to do with it, but they, they kind of did. needed the summer Jewish <laughs> the Jewish camp, and so there I'm learning Hebrew and I'm learning about all of the traditions and we're bre- we're baking challah and, you know, we're, we're having a, you know, there's two different fridges, one for the dairy and one for the meat and we can't mix them. And I was meeting more and I loved Jewish boys. I loved <laughs> Jewish boys. I don't know why. I just, I loved them. And so I thought, this is very confusing. I don't know why I'm not Jewish. I belong in this tribe and I'm going to marry a Jewish man. And I want to ha- I wanted to marry a Jewish man so I could get one of the really great last names. Right. Obviously. Yes. I wanted to be a Goldstein. I wanted to be uh, a, a Shapiro. I wanted to be a Sherman. I wanted to be a Cohen. So I, I set out to find my, I set out to find my Jewish husband and I was in New York City again, like meeting a lot of Jewish folks and on J date, like really <laughs> looking seriously so that I could have my, my Jewish family and live in New York city. And, and I was dating this guy and he said, he was very good, also very confused about my love of Judaism. And he said, if you, if you want to be Jewish, why don't you just convert and be Jewish? And I said, Oh, I never thought of that before. So <laughs> I took the classes. I studied with a rabbi. It all felt very natural to me. And then I converted. And then I was going to synagogue religiously because, of course, I was looking for I was looking for my Jewish husband at the synagogue. But every time I introduced myself, I had a name that wasn't Jewish. Right. And so people would look at me kind of funny, like, well, what are you doing here? And I would say, well, I'm Jewish. And but the, the name didn't fit. Yeah. And so I was getting my hair cut one day and I was talking about this with my hairstylist and she said, well, why don't you change your name to something more Jewish? Yeah, that would be fine. That's fine. For $50, you can change your name. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. It's $50. And so, it's $50. And so did you just automatically, did you know what it was automatically? So we were sitting there and I said, wouldn't it be amazing if my last name was Shapiro? Because Shapiro is a very very glitzy, very Hollywood Jewish name. Yep. I said, it has to be something really sparkly. And so she said, Shapiro. I said, yeah. And we have to throw a Shoshana in there because you can't be Jewish without being a Shoshana. Okay. And, and she said, yeah, it wouldn't be great if it was something like Bunny, Bunny Shapiro. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's the greatest <laughs> name It ever. really is the greatest like, name ever. It's very like Upper East Side, old lady, Chanel <laughs> Flats. You know what I mean? Like yes, it's, Avenue. but it's it's really beautiful. And so automatically, so you just did it like that week? Did you just do it? It's like I'm changing my name. That's it. It took a little while to, it took a little while. I had to do some consulting with some friends to make sure I wasn't totally insane. And then I, yeah, I went down there and I, I changed it and it was one of the, another crazy, amazing, <laughs> wonderful experiences. Like 
you can do whatever you want on this planet, <laughs> kind of. You really can. <laughs> but not many people are brave enough to do it. I think that was really the, the funniest part about it. It was like, okay, this is an option. <laughs> In the buffet of life, like I'm having this as well. Has Mexico made you even more spiritual? I mean, has it has it changed your spirituality or have you continued to grow and evolve in different ways? I'm sure. I mean, Mexico is a really is a really, really healing place. I'm sure you know that. Yeah. Um, there's something about it here, especially in Puerto Vallarta being near the mountains and the beach and the ocean and after being and working in the fashion industry in New York for 10 years, I needed, I needed to find uh, more of a middle ground. And so I came here and I, I mean, I was in New York. I, you know, I never ate bread <laughs> so that I could fit into very small leather pants. You know, that's really, yeah, that was, that a thing. was like, a big thing and I moved here and I ate I eat bread now and sometimes I don't wear shoes and <laughs> do you have do you have any advice for somebody who wants to make a drastic life change oh my gosh no <laughs> <laughs> a drastic life change I don't know I think that I've had so I've had so much success just trusting my just trusting my intuitive gui- my the guidance that I that I receive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm taking DJ lessons now to just make the story weirder. <laughs> I'm becoming an electronic DJ as well, which sounds so ridiculous. No, it doesn't. And also, but I can't ignore again. Can't Bunny ignore- Shapiro is the world's best DJ name, so it doesn't even. Yeah, are you kidding? That's what people are like. What would your DJ name be? I'm like, uh, Bunny do Shapiro. I need a different name? <laughs> so I just think that like taking I guess the advice is the the create the creative forces that be in the world are and this is back to spirituality I believe are communicating with me all the time yeah whether it's I get this I this crazy idea to take DJ lessons I can't ignore that because I've I've not ignored Right. So many ridiculous ideas over the course of my life that have have flourished into. And if if it doesn't work out, then you just say, oh, that didn't work out. Who yeah. cares? Who cares? Do you think you'll be in Mexico forever? I kind of do think that. I kind of do think that. Yeah. It's a great home base. I mean, I can you can get anywhere from here. I still can't remember if it's a if it's a Canadian thing too, but did you have a prom and did you what did you wear to the prom? So funny. <laughs> it's like a southern thing. Uh yeah, we definitely had a prom. <laughs> oh my gosh. I wish I could wait, do I have to provide a photo? Well, I would love one, but you don't oh. have to, but I would love that. But if I can find one, I will send it to you because I had <laughs> <laughs> Did you did you go to did you go to Detroit to the mall to buy it? No, girl. I had that thing, that bustier. <laughs> custom made. You know it. <laughs> velvet with butterflies. <laughs> black, black and purple and other colors. Butterflies. Like gothic lace up <laughs> bustier. <laughs> Boobs up to here, <laughs> fire engine, red, hair, updo, bang, sweep to the side. I mean, I get there's so much more long silk fitted skirt, slit up the back, platform, platform, like, slip on Swarovski crystal. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> Jewelry, makeup. I mean, do we even need to talk about that? Like, was that not makeup? Bright red lip. I mean, you know, I went to the Mac counter in the Bay. Bright red matte lips. At, at Devonshire Mall, we've got our appointments at the Mac counter. 
So she did some purple eyeshadow, <laughs> false lashes. There may have been a spray tan. <laughs> Jewelry, I can't. I Oh, I wore a black choker. It was some sort of black. Velvet? Choker. Like it was a ve- probably velvet. And the bustier, the corset had a matching purse. I mean, obviously, it obviously did. Just a tiny little. <laughs> oh, bunny. That was too much. I love that makes me so happy. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to get fired now from the fashion industry. <laughs> no, I think you're going to get promoted, actually. <laughs> oh. oh, I love it. <laughs> thank, thank you bunny I, what a what an absolute treat to talk to you today and I cannot wait to see you in person in a few weeks thanks Laura What We Wore is produced by Capital and Balto Creative Media the original song Someone So Enchanting was composed and performed by Britt Drazda queencitypodcastnetwork.com